Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Kuwait grants bail to politician jailed for insulting Amir. Human Rights Watch slams Qatar's new law on media censorship. And U.S. drone strikes spark outrage among Yemeni civilians. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Authorities in Kuwait released opposition deputy Musalam al-Barak on a 10,000 dinar bail. This step came at the same time as a decision that banned the organization from all demonstrations in the future. The opposition calls for ongoing demonstrations this coming Sunday under the banner The Demonstration for Dignity. Nightly demonstrations, which lasted until dawn today, erupted as a result of the authorities' extension of al-Barak's detention for an additional 10 days. Al-Barak is facing accusations related to insulting the emir of Kuwait. I never expected that one day such an accusation could be made. After a fiery night with confrontations on the streets between protesters and security forces, Kuwaiti authorities decided to release prominent opposition member Musalam al-Barak on a 10,000 dinar bail. The court's time frame to look into his case will be announced at a later time. The court warned that it will take rigorous measures against those who participate in demonstrations. Kuwait's opposition leaders called for an emergency meeting in the wake of violent confrontations that lasted through the night between protesters and security forces, according to activist statements. A former opposition deputy said that the meeting will be attended by all opposition groups and youth activists. It will look into the circumstances of the confrontations that occurred on Wednesday night until dawn on Thursday in several parts of Kuwait. Eyewitnesses said that Kuwaiti security forces used tear gas and smoke bombs to disperse a demonstration in which thousands of people participated. It headed to the central prison carrying a sign with a picture of al Barak behind bars attached to it and demands for his release written underneath. The protests took place hours after the decision by Kuwait's public prosecution to detain al Barak for 10 days to address the charges brought against him. Kuwait's interior ministry stated in a press release that a number of people it called rioters and instigators who organized a demonstration that reached several residential areas were arrested and referred for investigation. It indicated that demonstrators closed roads and attacked police with rocks and bottles, which resulted in the injury of five policemen. Activists said that dozens of people, among them children, were transported to a hospital for tear gas inhalation. Three related accusations were brought against al Barak for criticizing the country's emir. During that gathering, al Barak had warned the emir, Sheikh Sabah al Ahmed al Sabah, of the consequences of amending the election system. He also warned of turning Kuwait into an authoritarian state. These events occurred before parliamentary elections, which are expected to take place in December. But the opposition announced it would boycott the elections because of what it said was an approach that aims to bring an obedient parliament that is supportive of the government. Rima Shnoon, BBC. Human Rights Watch, HRW, has condemned the draft of the new media law in Qatar for containing excessive penalties against those who criticize the state and neighboring countries. The organization urged the Qatari government not to approve the draft law, which it described as a firm commitment to censorship. 
It's a commitment to censorship and does not support freedom of the press. This is how the organization, Human Rights Watch, described the new amendment to the media law in Qatar. According to media experts, the amendment, the first since 2008, came as a result of fear of the Arab Spring. Qatar fears that what it once exported to others will come back to harm it in the future. What pushed the Qatari government to issue these amendments is their fear of the Arab Spring. They fear that what they once exported to others will come back to harm them in the future. And they fear that there will be demands for a free press that doesn't shed light or criticize those outside their borders, but rather takes aim at those within Qatar. It shouldn't exclude the royal family and the ruling institution there from criticism. Therefore, as a procedural measure, the government issued this decision. The amendment included Article 53 of the law, under which any information regarding the relationship between Qatar and Arab or friendly nations, or those interested in harming the system or the ruling family, will be prohibited from being published or broadcast. The issuance of this law by the emirs once again reminds us that the Qatari regime hides behind its dictatorship and behind its suppression of freedoms. It doesn't wish to see its country enjoying a free press and media that is compatible with the principles of freedom of speech in the free world. The media is freedom, evolution, progress. Media is change in society. These countries fear any change that happens. Any change in society represents a danger for them because they are rulers who are not supported by their populations. Under the new amendment, violators will be punished with incarceration or a financial fine of up to 75,000 U.S. dollars. HRW described the law as failing to meet international standards, which cuts our claims to support. In addition, HRW said that the wording of the amendment was vague. From Baghdad, Razak al Hili al Iraqiya. Anti-U.S. sentiments are once again on the rise in Yemen as American assassination drones lurk in the skies of the Middle Eastern country. Yemenis have called on the government to end the U.S. aerial attacks, which they say has caused more instability. Recipes Yusuf Mari has this report from Aden. The continuous use of U.S. deadly drones in Yemen has outraged Yemenis nationwide. They believe that the attacks have mainly killed innocent civilians and destroyed local homes under the so-called war on terror. Much of the Yemeni provinces have witnessed these types of attacks, mainly in the southern part of the country, which is where we went to get the people's general view on what they described as a violation of the country's independence. Yemen is, as a whole, reject the use of U.S. assassination drones and the intervention which has killed innocent people. This is a violation of our independence, and I believe that the continuous use of these drones will only fuel more anger. Many Yemenis believe that the political disputes among political parties have opened the doors for more foreign intervention in the country. Despite these differences, most Yemenis in the north and south have expressed strong condemnation over the American foreign policy. The U.S. deadly drones have hit everywhere in Yemen. Because of this aggression, all Yemenis are united on the fact that this is an aggression and a violation of our basic rights. In recent months, the Yemeni government has come under heavy pressure for allowing U.S. intervention in the country's internal affairs. However, officials have confirmed that the U.S. military support is vital in fighting al-Qaeda and that the deadly drones are being conducted under the president's approval. People in the South strongly reject the U.S. intervention on our land. Who will accept foreign intervention on his own land? The Sana'a's government is allowing such intervention. The transitional period in Yemen is set to last until presidential elections take place in 2014. A new Yemeni president is to be elected, as was stressed by the U.S.-backed peace initiative signed last year between Ali Saleh and members of the Yemeni opposition.
During the past two years, the number of U.S. drone assassination strikes has increased in the southern part of the country dramatically under the so-called War on Terror, which in reality has claimed the lives of many innocent Yemenis. Yusuf Maudi, Press TV, Aden. Iraq's fugitive Vice President Tarek al Hashemi is sentenced to death for a second time on criminal charges. Hashemi has been charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate an interior ministry official. He has not commented on the ruling yet. Hashemi was given his first death sentence in September on charges of running death squads. He said the case was built on testimony extracted under torture. The fugitive VP is now in Turkey and authorities there have refused to hand him over to the Iraqi government. Hashmi fled to Turkey earlier this year after a brief stop in Iraq's semi-autonomous Kurdistan region and a tour that took him to Qatar and Saudi Arabia. At least 22 people have been killed and over 100 wounded in a major blast in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. The blast reportedly occurred when a fuel tanker exploded in the eastern part of Riyadh. The exact details of the incidents are still unknown. Initial reports said the blast occurred as the truck crashed into an overpass. Eyewitnesses say an industrial building has been destroyed. Several buildings were also damaged and nearby vehicles caught on fire. Saudi officials are yet to explain the exact details of the blast. The Tunisian presidency announced an extension of the state of emergency for an additional three months instead of a single month, as is custom. This means that it will last until the end of January of next year. The decision came with the ongoing tense situation between security forces and Salafis in the province of Manuba, west of the capital, Tunis. It came after the killing of two Salafis in which the interior minister threatened to firmly and strictly apply the law. Reporting from Tunis, Ramzi Hafayed. For the ninth time since it was introduced on February 14th of last year, the state of emergency in Tunisia has been extended. The measure announced by Prime Minister Monsef al Marzouki extends to the end of next January. Overall, and extraordinarily, it was welcomed on the Tunisian street. I imagine the extensions will continue. Any event, fire or spark will continue to prolong it. I say we need to have a truce and clarify the situation because this means that any event can extend the state of emergency due to the ongoing push and pull. In Tunisia, after the revolution, we've needed to maintain a state of emergency because Tunisia has become engulfed in chaos. People no longer have laws to abide by. They no longer have rules to live by. This step comes as an official response to the state of societal chaos, which was reflected in the Salafi violence against the American embassy and the confrontations that took place this week in the area of Duar Hijr, west of the capital. What is new is the switch from the one-month extension that has occurred since this past July to the three-month extension. This, of course, goes back to the evolution of the escalating pattern of violence in Tunisia, in particular, the Salafi violence. It appears that there is agreement at the highest levels of the need to confront the violence, no matter what the source is. This was a matter stressed by the interior minister, threatening those committing violence with a strict and severe application of the law, one extension after the other for the state of emergency in Tunisia. It reflects the unstable situation the country has been living in for over a year, as well as social mobilization that foreshadows more than one scenario over the next few days. The Libyan parliament, which gave a vote of confidence to the government of Ali Zidane, is still under the control of a group of angry former revolutionaries. Despite the political bureau for Libya's revolutionaries assuring its full support for parliament as the one legitimate authority, they criticize the financial and administrative corruption that has been seen in the country. It announced its solidarity with the demonstrators who are protesting the government of Ali Zaidan in front of parliament. Ali Zaidan had promised the revolutionaries that he would replace the ministers that do not conform to the standards of national integrity. He did so after presenting their portfolios to the High Commission of Integrity and after they participated in managing the country's undersecretaries for a number of ministries. The media spokesman for Syrian refugees in Jordan, Anmar Lahmoud, said that 257 refugees crossed into Jordan yesterday due to the ongoing violence in their country. 
He added that the Jordanian government took all measures necessary to accommodate the refugees and offered their services in the kingdom. The spokesman said that 26 Syrian refugees at the Zatari camp returned to their country at their own request. In Cairo, the joint UN Arab envoy, Lakhtar Brahimi, briefed the Secretary General of the Arab League, Nabil al Arabi, on the outcome of his visits to Moscow and Beijing. Meanwhile, all eyes are focused on the outcome of the two upcoming meetings on Syria. One meeting will be held by Arab foreign ministers in Cairo to discuss ways to help end the Syrian crisis. The second meeting will be held by the Syrian National Council, the SNC, in Doha to discuss the transitional phase, the person responsible for running affairs during that phase, and the drafting of a plan to expand the SNC. There are ongoing efforts aimed at ending the bloodshed in Syria and finding a political consensus between the opposition and the regime. Starting with the Chinese initiative, China called for a cessation of fire implemented district by district and in stages, as well as for the formation of a transitional government council, as confirmed by the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei. This news comes after Brahimi met with the Chinese Foreign Minister yesterday. In a notable development, the international community is shifting its position on the Syrian opposition, following the U.S.'s call to move beyond the SNC and to bring in those who are fighting on the front lines. During her visit to Croatia, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton called for the formation of a trustworthy opposition, noting that the meeting slated for next week in Qatar will be an opportunity to bring more people to the bargaining table. There needs to be an opposition. There needs to be an opposition that can speak to every segment and every geographic part of Syria. And we also need an opposition that will be, on record, strongly resisting the efforts by extremists to hijack the revolution. For its part, the SNC held the international community responsible for the expansion of extremist influence in Syria. SNC Chairman Abdel Basit Saida attributed the Council's shortcomings to the world's lack of support for the Syrian people in opposing President Bashar al-Assad's regime. On the ground, clashes continue to rage between regime forces and the armed opposition. At least 28 regime soldiers were killed in fierce clashes in the country's north. The clashes erupted after fighters from several brigades launched a fierce attack on three military posts along the road to Aleppo, as confirmed by the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. In addition, warplanes launched airstrikes on various towns in the countryside of Damascus and on villages in northwestern Syria. Other areas also endured heavy shelling by regime forces, according to the observatory. In another development, official Syrian TV said that armed terrorists bombed an oil pipeline in the country's northern province of Tirazur, setting the area on fire. Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was accompanied by French President Francois Hollande today as he traveled to Toulouse in the southern part of France to take part in a memorial ceremony for the four people who were killed at a local Jewish school earlier this year. We get more in this report from IBA's Dennis Zinn. On the second day of his trip to France, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu traveled to the southern town of Toulouse where last March a rabbi and three children were murdered during an anti-Semitic attack at a Jewish school. Netanyahu was accompanied by French President François Hollande. The two leaders attended a ceremony at the school where the killings took place and met members of the local Jewish community who were clearly moved by the fact that both Netanyahu and Hollande arrived to offer their condolences. Toulouse Jewish officials told the two heads of government that the community is living in fear due to the large hostile Muslim population in the town, a problem that is becoming pervasive throughout France. Indeed, we, the questions that every, uh, most Jews in France ask themselves is what will be the future of uh, the Jewish community in France? Um, and is there, it's not a question of security, it's, a que it's also a question of living together, it's a question of, of social cohesion. Meanwhile, after the pomp and ceremony at the Elysee Palace yesterday, today Netanyahu was subject to rowdy demonstrations. Hundreds took to the streets in Paris and Toulouse to protest what they called Israel's mistreatment of Palestinians and said that the Israeli Prime Minister should be arrested. 
they held posters condemning Israel and chanted slogans. We don't agree uh, with the visit of uh, Netanyahu here. We don't agree with the fact that he is welcomed by the French government, maybe, or at least he should be, as a war criminal, he should be arrested, he should be prevented to, to travel outside Israel. A small pro-Israel rally took place near the Israeli embassy under tight security. Meanwhile, members of the delegation accompanying the Prime Minister said they are pleased with what they heard from French officials up to now. Cabinet Secretary Svi Hauser said most of the discussion between Netanyahu and Hollande centered around the Iranian issue and that France is clearly strongly opposed to Tehran's nuclear ambitions. Hauser said that the French president assured Netanyahu that he is well aware that a nuclear-armed Iran is a danger to the whole world and not only to Israel. Dennis Zinn, ABA News. Local politics popped up at Netanyahu's news conference in Paris, where he was asked what he thinks about reports that Likud communications minister Moshe Kahlon is considering the formation of a new party to run in the January elections. Here with that story is IBA's political reporter Eli Wogelinter. Eli? Yes, Aaron, never a dull moment in Israeli politics. The famous line used by vendors at a baseball game is, you can't tell the players without a scorecard, and that could easily be applied to Israeli elections. The latest player thinking about getting back into the game is Communications Minister Moshe Kahlon, arguably the most popular minister in the outgoing government. Two weeks ago, he said he was quitting politics for a timeout, but stressed that he would work for the party to ensure it won the election. But now, Kahlon, or the people around him, are conducting a two-day poll to gauge his popularity, and he is reportedly considering launching a breakaway party to rival his only could. Initial polls are showing that Kahlon could win 20 or more seats at the head of a new party. The poll also shows Likud Beitenu receiving only 28 mandates. And should Kahlon run on a ticket with Tzipi Livni, with the former foreign minister heading the ticket, their party would win 26 Knesset seats. When asked about the latest political developments at his news conference in Paris yesterday, Netanyahu said Kahlon, quote, explicitly told me that he was staying in the Likud. He said the same thing publicly, and I believe he will stay in the Likud. Meanwhile, a new poll today will give everyone more numbers to crunch and harder political decisions to make. That's because these new numbers present a different picture than what we've heard so far. The poll conducted by the geocartography research firm shows a party headed by Kahlon would garner only 10 seats, with one seat coming at the expense of the newly merged Likud Yisrael Beitenu party. According to the poll, Labour voters represent the bulk of Kahlon's potential power, drawing three seats off of Shelly Yachimovich's party, with another two seats coming from Shas voters and supporters of the National Union. Should Kahlon not run, here are the numbers for the parties and principals who have declared that they are running. If elections were held today, the Likud Yisrael Beitenu bloc would win 44 seats, Labour 19, Yesha Tid 14, and Shas 12. This shows that the super right-wing party is solid, picking up an additional two seats more than they have now. The families of the forcefully disappeared in Yemen have criticized the authorities' attempts to approve the transitional justice law and national reconciliation and prepare for the National Dialogue Conference without including the cases of those who have disappeared among its priorities or the issues slated for discussion. After the 2011 revolution, there has been a clear rise in efforts to uncover the fates of those who have disappeared since the 1960s. Three and a half decades passed before the story resurfaced once again. The cases of minors who disappeared between the 1960s and 1990s due to political conflicts and the wars between Yemen's north and south. The cases found an unusual revival after the peaceful Yemeni revolution in 2011, as new documents and evidence were uncovered about those who disappeared. Marches were organized in Sana'a and other cities to call on the government to reveal the truth and punish those who caused it. Those who are looking for their fathers and those who are searching for their brothers, you have been searching for your families, family members who have been missing for a long time. 
Salwa is part of one of the families of those forcefully disappeared. Her father, Ali Khana Sohra, was someone that military commanders had abducted in 1977 under mysterious circumstances. We call for reopening the cases of those who were forcefully disappeared because it is our right to know their fates. If they're alive, where are they? And if they're dead, then where are their remains, their bodies? Where were they buried? The families of those who were forcefully disappeared seek to escalate their case in several ways. They are trying to find compelling answers about their fates. The families are also trying to remind people of them. A campaign by a young Yemeni artist aims to draw the faces of some of those who were forcefully disappeared on walls in the capital, Sana'a, and to revive their case, which has been shrouded in darkness. In their demands, the families of the disappeared confirmed that it is in their constitutional and human rights to know their fates. These families criticize the government, political parties, and some civil societies for diligently seeking to adopt the transitional justice law and national reconciliation, as well as beginning to prepare for the National Dialogue Conference without including the issue among the priorities proposed. Ahmed al Salafi, Al Jazeera, Sanaa. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.